All right, welcome back to another answer key for some practice problems. This time we've got exam four coming up, so we're nearing the end of the semester, but at the same time, there's still a lot of points on the board uh, with this uh, exam number four and your final exam. So please don't get um, you know too tired yet. We still got a couple weeks that are gonna be really important for your grade. So let's go ahead and dive in. Uh, this one deals with um, a bit of redox chemistry and thermodynamics. And this first one's easily thermodynamics and it's essentially a, a definitions question, right? We talked in class about how some people confuse heat and temperature and in everyday language they might be used uh, somewhat similarly or interchangeably, but in our precise language of thermodynamics they are most certainly not. And so if you think about heat, well what is heat? Heat is uh, the most important thing to know about heat, right, is that it is a uh, energy transfer, right? That's really important. It's a type of energy transfer. And so you need to know that. That's the biggest deal. And it's an energy transfer from where to where. It's, it's a transfer of energy from an area of high temperature to an area of low temperature. And that's pretty simple, right? Deals with the idea of, um, you know, if you had high speed molecules, um, and you, they have lots of energy and you've got some low speed molecules, well that energy is going to transfer until, until their speeds, uh, the fast ones slow down and the slow ones speed up and that's how you get that energy transfer and we know that is heat. Temperature is really important, right? Temperature, we talked about temperature is a very specific definition in thermodynamics and in previous uh, discussions of the course and therm uh, temperature is simply what? It's a, a measure, right? It's a measure of what? the average translational kinetic energy. And that's really important, right? That relates back to our discussion of uh, gases, right? In kinetic molecular theory and how um, you look at the velocity, right? Because kinetic energy is one half mv squared. And so you can relate that to the kinetic energy, but also relate it to molecular speed. So that, that's pretty straightforward. And that's more of a definition question. This next one, deals with one of the many ways we've learned how to calculate enthalpy, right? And in this case, we're looking for uh, a reaction here. We're essentially taking methane, right? And this is important. Methane has what? It has four uh, CH bonds, one, two, three, four. And we're taking two molecules of oxygen, right? That's gonna be two times O double bond O. And this is essentially what a combustion reaction. We're burning this methane in the presence of oxygen and we're gonna form one carbon dioxide, but it's important to note that one carbon dioxide has two carbon oxygen double bonds and we're forming two uh, moles of water and that has four OH bonds, right? And so that's really important. And so what we can do is we can kind of divide this down and we can say, what's happening here? Well, these bonds and the reactants, we can think of these bonds as being broken. So we're gonna break these bonds. And remember, you have to put energy in to break a bond, right? It's hard work to rip a bond apart. Uh, bonds are inherently um, somewhat stable, right? Or they wouldn't be formed. You wouldn't just have methane and oxygen floating around if these bonds weren't uh, low energy. And so we look at this and we can see, wow, there's a lot of bond energy in, locked up in these bonds. So in order, order to break them, we have to put in at least this much energy. So in this case, we've got four CH bonds. So we can say we have four moles, right? One, two, three, four, four moles or four bonds, however you want to say it times what? Times that's going to be um, 413 kilojoules per mole. And to that we're going to add, right, because we got to break those two two moles of the O2, or the, o, the O double bond O, and that is two times 495, right? And make sure you can read the table. It's really easy to get misaligned there and if I add those up I get something like positive and why is it positive because we have to put energy in to break those we have to put energy in to break them apart and I got something like 2642 kilojoules right and then over here we're gonna form these bonds so we're gonna form these bonds and when you form bonds energy is released you get that much out and so we have two moles of the CO, right? And we're gonna say that's 799, that's a strong bond. We get a lot of energy out of that. And then we've got four moles of the OH, and we looked that up, that's again a pretty strong bond. And if you look at that, we've broken six bonds that are, you know, medium strength, and we've formed six bonds, one really strong, four medium, so it looks like we're gonna get more out than we put in. 
And remember, this is negative because that is energy being released when you form those bonds. And I got negative 3450, uh, and that's in kilojoules. You add these together. Did you put more energy in or get more energy out? Well, it looks like the energy out wins. So overall, this is going to be a negative, which means this is exothermic. I got 808 kilojoules, which makes sense. If this is combustion, if you're burning methane, that better be exothermic. And that is essentially the delta H of that reaction. This one down here, it says oh, pretty much what we answered uh, for enthalpy. Let's do that for entropy. Well, we say, okay, for the combustion of methane, predict the sign. And no math here, we just predict is are the reactants or the products more disordered, right? Because entropy is a measure of disorder. Well, Remember, the most disordered phase of matter by far is gas. So here we have one, two, three, right? We have three moles of gas in the reactant side going to one, two, oh wait, that's a liquid, so that doesn't count. That's a, a much less disordered state of matter. Liquids and solids are, are much more ordered or much less disordered than gases. So we went from three moles of gas to one mole of gas and in this case, since you decrease the number of moles of gas, this the sign of delta S for this reaction is clearly going to be negative because you went from three moles of gas to one mole of gas. This is much uh, less disordered or more ordered, however you want to say it, and the disorder goes down. So when disorder goes down, the sign of delta S is negative. All right. And then the next one kind of combines both of these, right? So we talked about our discussion of uh, Gibbs free energy and if you think about Gibbs free energy that's equal to delta H minus T delta S and remember up above we already said that's exothermic and so remember if you want this to be spontaneous the sign of delta G needs to be negative and so if delta H is already negative for an exothermic reaction that's good that's helping you get to um, spontaneity get to a negative delta G so enthalpy is helping you However, remember we said that delta S was negative, and when you subtract a negative, that's kind of like adding a positive. So that's bringing the value up away from negative region. You don't want this to hurt you, so the way you can do it is try to kill this term by keeping T really small. So in this case, delta H is helping you go to negative, which is where you want to be. Delta S being negative minus a negative is going to be positive, so that's going to take you away from the negative region, so you don't want to do that. So in this case, we'd like to keep our reaction at very low temperatures to minimize entro entropy, which is not helping us, maximize the enthalpy, and help us get delta G to negative, right? Because negative delta G is what? That is spontaneous, and that's really important. We want to keep that delta G negative, really important. All right, that's the first page, pretty simple. Second page, this kind of gets at something we, we sort of did in lab, right? We said, okay, well, in lab we added two solutions to a coffee cup calorimeter and we tried to find um, a value for the heat transfer. And so here we're looking at the, the Q for the reaction of the dissolution of this ammonium nitrate to form these two ions. We're doing this in water. And so this is really simple. We can just basically say that zero, right, is gonna be equal to Q of the reaction plus uh, the mass of the uh, water and or we can say the, the mass of the mixture is probably a better way to say it because we're going to be dumping this solid with some water so that's important times the specific heat of water times the delta T well that's pretty easy and in this case did they give us a C cal and the answer is no so if you're not given a C cal this is a perfect again perfect ideal calorimeter. If it's not perfect, I have to give you the C-Cal as the correction factor, as we talked about in lab. But so if, you, if you don't see a C-Cal, you can assume C-Cal, if it's perfect, is zero, right? So that's important to, to think about. So this one's pretty easy. We can say um, we're going to get here, we're going to get what? We're going to get, um, this is going to be Q reaction plus um, we've got 35 grams of water, and then we're going to add this many grams of this, so that's all going to mix together. We're going to form a solution, and I'm going to say that's roughly 36.5 grams of mixture in the coffee cup, because you got to think about the total mass of everything that's in that solution. Now, I know it's not pure water anymore, but we're going to say, since we don't have any other data, we're going to take the specific heat of water, and it's going to be in grams times degrees C, 
and then the delta t, right? And in this case, delta t is what? It went, oh, this is interesting. It went from high temperature to low temperature, so that means this must be an endothermic reaction. So the final temperature is 19.4 degrees C minus 22.7 degrees C. If we crank all that out, zero equals Q of the reaction equals negative all this, and I get something on the order of, uh, what did I get? I got 503.5 joules, and that would be the Q. Now, if we want to find delta H, which is probably important, um, you know, because in this case we want to know, remember it said not just K joules, but we want kilojoules per mole, we can take uh, that value, remember that, and I'm going to answer the question next down here while I do this, is that in this case we had what? This was a coffee cup. In the conditions of a coffee, coffee cup, delta P is zero because we're doing it constant pressure, right? That's important, constant pressure. So if that's the case, we get Q, the heat measure at constant pressure. Well, what is that? That's simply equal to delta H. And so that's really important. So in this case, delta H is going to be simply equal to the Q of the reaction equals 503.5 joules and then we have to find the moles right well that's easy you go back and you see that there's 1.505 grams of that compound all over um, I got something like 80.04 grams right per mole so if you do that you and, and you divide by a thousand I got something like positive 26.8 kilojoules per mole. So there you go. Pretty simple. You find the Q first, but then you have to be careful because the units want kilojoules per mole. So now we got to think about uh, the, the heat, right, which we took there, divided by the moles, and that's just some simple stoichiometry. How many moles in this amount of mass? And then there you go. Pretty easy. Now we already talked about this. Is this a enthalpy change or internal energy change? Well, like I just said, the conditions are change in pressure equals zero, right? Again, constant pressure. And when you have the conditions of heat measured at constant pressure, that is equal to delta H for all the der derived reasons we talked about, definitions of enthalpy versus in internal energy. And so you have to look back at your notes because I don't have 20 minutes to explain it here. But constant pressure, Q is equal to delta H. Constant volume, Q is equal to delta U. And you can go back to your notes for that. All right. This next one's kind of just some extra questions here. Um, remember, a state function was a state function. Well, state function is really important for a number of reasons, and that's because it's a function or a quantity that the only thing that matters, the only consideration, right? The only consideration is what? Nothing more than your final and your initial state. All you need to find is the delta, right? And delta of your function, right? So if you know the final and the initial, you know, you basically say delta equals, you know, um, your final minus your initial, and there you go. You don't care how you got there, you don't care the path that you took, you don't care about any of that. All you need to know is final and initial, and you can determine the quantity. And why is it so important? Well, in nature, there may be, may be cases where you have a reaction, right? You could have I don't know, you could have enthalpy over here and you know your reactants and your products and you could say we know our initial and our final and let's say in nature, nature takes some really complex pathway, right, that maybe we don't know about. Well, we can't probably measure that exactly in lab, but guess what? If we go in the lab and we have the same reactants and the same products and let's say in lab we go directly, well guess what? We have the exact same answer because our initial and our final, our initial, and our final are identical. So the path does not matter as long as we can find a path that helps us go from reactants to products and we can measure that, then we've measured the same quantity. And that's the beauty and the importance of a state function. Second law of thermodynamics is really simple, right? So for a spontaneous process, right? Spontaneous physical or chemical process, the delta S of the whole universe has to be what? It has to be greater than zero. And that's really important, right? Remember that the delta S for the universe is equal to what? It's equal to the delta S of the system that you're looking at plus 
the delta s of the surroundings. And that's, that's really tough because thinking about both of those is really challenging. However, the second law tells you that for any spontaneous process, the delta s for the universe has to be greater than zero, has to be positive, really important. And then finally, what does it mean by free energy? Well, free energy deals with Gibbs free energy, right? Delta G. And for this one, number one, it really helps us to know that, for remember delta G, negatives are spontaneous, right? And positives are non-spontaneous, right? And this tells us something really important. If you have a reaction that's spontaneous and you can calculate a delta G, when that reaction goes, it can generate that much energy that is free to be spent doing useful work or driving a reaction or whatever. And that's really important. Now, if you have a positive delta G, that means the reaction is not spontaneous, but we don't give up because we know that if we put that much energy into a reaction, we can force it to go even if it's not spontaneous by itself. And so that's really important. Okay, so we're moving along, trying to get this done. Um, I know a lot of you are really busy this week and you want to do well on this exam, so we'll try to get this done really quickly. This is a, a really fast problem set, I think. This is Hess's law, right? We have this heat of formation reaction, right? The formation of this diborane from its elements in the standard states, and we want to be able to calculate. We don't know this value, and how do we calculate it given all this information here? Well, Hess's law basically says that we can take information that we do know, add it all together, and get something that we don't know. And again, if you go back to your notes, this is another application of the state function. We can't do this directly, but we have these um, alternate uh, paths that we can cobble together to get the same thing and we get the right answer and so here we can look at that and we say we need two borons in the reactant side well if we look at this first reaction I got four that's too much we don't want four we want two so what I could do is multiply this whole thing by half and if I do that right that becomes two that becomes three halves and that becomes one that's really important so if we multiply this whole thing by half we have to take this value and multiply it by one half over here we've got three hydrogens well we only have one there so we're gonna multiply this by three and we'll get a three here we'll get a three halves there and we'll get a three there so we multiply this whole thing by three and then finally we have we need this diborane well the only place I see it is here but we need it to be over here we need to flip this reaction in order to flip that reaction you multiply it by negative one and if you do all that everything else cancels out and we multiply this one by negative one. If we add all this together, if you add all these together, right, add these together, you get the reaction that we want, which is really powerful. And if you add these all together, I get something like positive 35 kilojoules per mole of this diborane. And there you go, pretty simple. Now down here at the bottom, um, we've got a, a electrochemistry redox question or two. and this one's really kind of a fun one. I like this one. It says you're given these three different things and you want to know which one can give you the highest possible voltage, the highest E cell value. Well, what you do is you just go to your table of redox potentials and you say, okay, well, um, which one is the, the best oxidizing agent and the best reducing agent? And if you go through, uh, you can see here that the best pair that we could find would be copper and aluminum. And I'm going to let you go on your table of redox potentials and prove that to yourself and if you want to find the E cell for that it's pretty simple it's going to be E uh, reduction minus E ox uh, or E cathode minus E anode but I typically do it this way which is easier for me to see and then you're going to say for I think it's copper right it's 34 that's going to be um, reduced minus and just read it right off the table um, the aluminum I think is like negative of 166 volts you add all, or you minus both of you take this one subtract this one and then finally I think just by coincidence you get a perfect 2.00 volts which is kinda cool but that's the biggest combination you want to get the the strongest oxidizer the strongest reducing um, agent and then boom you're good so prove that one to yourself if you're having a hard time and make sure you can get that answer last but not least it's let's let's make a, a picture of what this would look like and so I'm gonna say okay well I'm gonna draw some electrodes right we need some electrodes to make this happen my funky looking electrodes there we gotta have a little voltmeter right to measure this and then probably just real quickly we can draw a little salt bridge we know we're gonna need that don't worry so much about the salt bridge oh, it's terrible 
Uh, remember, the anode is what hap is what where what happens. Well, oxidation happens to the anode. So in this case, the aluminum is going to be oxidized, and so we're going to get aluminum being oxidized to aluminum three plus. Right, that's going to be aqueous plus three electrons. So if that's at the anode, we can say this is going to be the anode, and you're going to have oxidation going on there. This guy is going to be aluminum. We're going to make a solution, right? solution here and we're going to have some aluminum 3 plus in there right that's important and the electrons are going to always go from uh, change colors here just for sake of argument here the electrons right are going to go from anode to cathode and that's really important to remember that and over here at the cathode we're going to have copper 2 plus right being uh, reduced to uh, what? The copper zero, right? Copper solid. And so over here we can say this one is going to be copper. We're going to have some solution, blah, blah, blah. And then the copper two plus is going to be in there. And I don't know, you could have some sodium perhaps and some nitrate in your uh, salt bridge there. Not too worried about it, but pretty simple. And if you, you multiply this guy by two and this guy by three you can get a least common multiple so you create six electrons and and absorb or consume six electrons and the overall reaction when you add it together is going to be two aluminum solids plus I believe three uh, copper two pluses and that's going to be aqueous going to what that's going to give us two aluminum three plus aqueous right plus what? It's going to be three copper um, solid and when you do that I think everything balances and you're in good shape so um, I think that brings us to the end of this one it's one of our quickest answer keys so I hope it's very helpful um, you know we had some good turnout at the review session I hope that was helpful and uh, just work really hard I know you guys are, are kind of stressed right now and going through a lot of uh, you know exams and projects and and papers on the run up to Thanksgiving break but I think if you put the time in you can be rewarded and, and make sure you you understand all this stuff and so it's really important so uh, study hard and I hope you can do really well take care bye bye